not a, not a complicated forgiveness. Sometimes we can make even God's forgiveness very complicated, can't we? The, the, we, we? We require people to do all sorts of things to get themselves in a position to receive forgiveness. And that's not the forgiveness of our Lord. Uh, I want to speak to you today on a title, sermon title that I'm, I'm calling uh, Easy Forgiveness. Now that kind of can probably set some people on edge a little bit. Uh, because most of us have never experienced forgiveness coming easily. Wouldn't you agree? But in most of the sermons that we've heard in churches throughout history uh, have focused on the blessings of you forgiving somebody and how when you hold and harbor resentment that really uh, the person who is affected the most by that is you, not the person you have resentment for. But I want to talk about a different forgiveness today. I want to talk about the forgiveness that the Lord offers to every single one of us. Uh, we hear a lot about forgiveness, especially in the church world. Jesus spoke a lot about forgiveness. That topic was a key point in his message, uh, his overall message. Some might even say that the message of forgiveness was the central theme and point of much of his messages. During the course of Jesus' life uh, in the nation of Israel, redemption and the return were two main points of Jesus' Uh, Jewish heritage and his history. Uh, sometimes we lose sight of the fact that in the first Passover, uh, when the nation of Israel was in Egypt, uh, redemption was a main part of that Passover. What happened when the people put the blood on the doorposts of their homes? When the death angel came, they were spared didn't matter even the terrible things you may have done that day didn't matter what your neighbor thought about you uh, didn't matter about anything as long as you had the blood over the doorposts of your home the death angel passed over you if you went into that uh, moment in time thinking well I'm a pretty good guy uh, I don't need to do that. Why should I take one of my pet lambs, bring it in the home, kill it, put the blood on my dog? Who's going to wash that blood off there anyways? And if you went into that event with thinking you were good enough to get by without that, the terrible consequences became very plain and obvious the very next day when the firstborn was no longer alive. So we see the aspect of forgiveness regarding, regardless of behavior. We also see there was one other aspect in the whole Passover, and that was the Exodus. God isn't just interested in forgiving us, but he's interested also in freeing us from whatever bondages could possibly be in our lives whether it's sins committed against us from our parents or grandparents, family members, neighbors, whatever, to the sins that we ourselves may have committed and gotten ourselves into a sticky wicket and some very bad patterns in our lives. So we see in the Passover story, there's forgiveness, but there's also uh, freedom that was part of that story. Later on in the nation of history, in the nation of Israel's history, they again went into captivity again when the Babylonian Empire came in and took them into captivity. And we see there that there was also uh, feasts and celebrations that would celebrate the return of the nation of Israel back to their homeland, as well as a reconciliation. And Jesus kind of picked up on the story with the story of the prodigal son. 
where the scripture says that he found himself in a faraway country, a faraway country, a, a distant land, very much like Israel was. And when he determined that he would go back to his father's home, his father uh, made a list of things for him to do in order for that to happen. You should all say, no! <laughs> when his father saw him a far way off, he ran to him and welcomed him. And so we have this being in a distant country and reconciliation happening. And then we find that in the life of Jesus, many of the cures that Jesus performed, healings, cures, are actually connected to forgiveness. So we see the paralytic where the, his friends put this guy down through the roof of the house and there's a bunch of religious leaders watching his every move. And we see this story in Matthew chapter 9, verses 5 through 7, where Jesus says this. Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up and went home. I find this really kind of an intriguing verse in that Jesus equates uh, uh, what's, what's easier to say. Your sins are forgiven or take up your mat and go home. And uh, I think what's implied in this verse, it's not that it's, it's more difficult for God uh, to heal versus to forgive. But he is making a contrast here about what, what's easier to say. Your sins are forgiven or to take up your mat and go home and be healed. And at the end of the day, the implication is the easier thing to say was your sins are forgiven. And when you look at healing, not every prayer that's prayed for healing happens. Because I do think there are other factors, other contingencies that are part of that equation so that not every prayer for healing always goes answered in the way that we, would, we ask it to go. But on the other hand, there's never a prayer for forgiveness that is ever met with. Well, there's other factors involved here that you have to meet. See, we're never met with that with Jesus. When you were telling the story of the prodigal son, it just hit me that before he even had a chance to say he was sorry. Right. He interrupted them. Yes. Yeah. Yes. He was running yeah. to greet him. And he was, his, his son was basically coming home to be a slave. He said, my, my dad's servants have it better than I do. You know, I'm sitting in this pig pen. I've lost everything. I'm, basically, he was in bondage, wasn't he? He said, I'm going to go home, and, and I will at least have something to eat. And he didn't understand the value of his life to his father. And that's the struggle that we all have today. And this is why I want to focus this message on the forgiveness that is available to us. And you know what it really is? I call this title, It's Easy Forgiveness. But it's basically this. It's a forgiveness made easy. That's what it is. It's a forgiveness made easy. Jesus wanted to, the cure in this particular case with this paralytic to show that he had authority to forgive sins. And what ticked off the religious leaders? That he actually forgave this guy of his sins. He not only healed him that day, but he forgave him of his sins. Because he can cure illness, he can also forgive sins. And to be honest with you, the forgiveness is the more important of the two. The forgiveness is the more important of the two. No other factors in this forgiveness, just forgiveness. He didn't start bartering with this guy on the mat and say, well, I got a healing for you, but here's what I need from you. 
There was no bartering for his healing. And there was certainly no bartering for his forgiveness. It was something that was in the heart of Christ to do. And on the one hand, Jesus wants us to be committed to him. Agreed? He wants us to be committed to righteousness. He even says to us, take up your cross, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, and that's a whole other message. It's not flawlessness, but it's, it's being perfect in heart. But on the other hand, God seems to readily accept people right as they are and who they are and where they're at and forgive them. He does that. He forgives their sins without demanding requirements or conditions or even compensation. Now, of course, I know there's theological people out there that would say, oh, what about repentance? Well, of course, repentance is an aspect of relational reconciliation. And uh, there's, there's taking ownership of our sins. I would say if you were genuinely asking for forgiveness, you are genuinely taking ownership of what you've done wrong, right? You know, any time that we ask forgiveness of each other, don't put that silly word but in there. Because the word but, B-U-T, is a disclaimer that you had reasons for doing what you did. And therefore, you're really not really guilty for what you've done. But all you need to do, even if you're only 1% wrong, and they were 99% wrong, just own that 1%. And don't point out what they've done. Just be humble and contrite. Because, I, and I'm con absolutely convinced of this, the people who struggle with forgiving others are the same people who have not truly realized the forgiveness they've been able to receive from God. When they really receive, when we really understand what we've been forgiven of, we hold no more grudges. We find it easier to forgive. There's no deal-making here with God. There's no transaction-keeping. No, if you do this, I will do that. This paraplegic was healed, and Jesus says, your faith has saved you. Peter denies Jesus, and what does Jesus say to him? I forgive you. And then he asks him a one simple question. Not, did you learn your lesson? But do you love me? Do you love me? Thomas was treated with, in a very similar way. Jesus had some corrective words to him, of course, but no harsh punishment to him. And of course, the parable of the workers in the vineyard is one of my favorite stories where the people who were hired the last hour of the day got the same wages as those who worked all day long. And this whole parable, of course, is about forgiveness. It's about eternal life. It's, it's about our eternal destiny that we have in Christ. And so it was forgiveness made easy I like, I, I, I've been growing fonder and fonder of this term, easy forgiveness, because Jesus forgives wrongs and treats people gently, even if many in our culture and society would only offer forgiveness after receiving some type of compensation, some type of amends, some type of promise, some type of transaction. I think one of the things we find in our culture is many people are very angry with themselves. Many people in our culture don't like themselves because of all the failures that they have made in their lives. I shouldn't have done that. We're very fond of saying that, aren't we? I shouldn't have done that. Oh, man, I made a big mistake. It was just something I did wrong. Or, here's the one, I'm not what I should be. I'm not what I should be. But isn't forgiveness and forgiveness where, where Jesus says, it's okay, just move forward? Isn't that really the heart of Christ? Let's move forward. I forgive you. 
And I absolutely believe that penance and contriteness, when we've received forgiveness, when we've really understood that we've been forgiven, it creates a contriteness and a penance in our hearts. I think the term uh, proud and forgiven don't go in the same sentence. It's not a description of a person who has truly been forgiven of everything and they are proud and arrogant. They can't be that way. I was telling Jackie just the other day, uh, because she'll she'll testify to this, that uh, I never complain about whatever food she prepares for me. Aren't I blessed? (laughs) But I, has, I, I haven't always been that way. And the transformation happened for me. Jackie and I were in a discipleship school. Uh, we were engaged. We weren't married yet. So it was a few years ago. <laughs> and one of the uh, aspects of this discipleship training school was we, the, the men broke up into teams and we were given bicycles to go to different towns and cities off of the, of the headquarters where our, our school was at. And we were given a bike and $5, and we were supposed to come back with the bike and $5 a week later and trust God for our provisions. And so I was the leader of my team, and we took off. We pedaled. We were going to... Uh, a, a city, a town, maybe, tw- yeah, Vallejo. We were in Sebastopol, California. We were going to Vallejo, California. It was maybe, I don't know, 30 miles, something like that. Bike ride, 40 miles, I don't know. Uh, so it's getting late in the day, the first day, and we haven't eaten anything because we don't have any food. And we were tired, and we stopped by the side of the road, and there was a walnut tree next to the side of the road. And I walked over to the walnut tree, and there were three walnuts on the ground. One for me, and one for each of my two buddies. And when I ate that walnut, the Lord reminded me of all the meals that my mother had made me, that I never said thank you, I left my dirty plate on the table, expecting her to clean it up. And one walnut changed my life. When I sat there and I said, thank you, Lord, for this meal of a walnut. Could you please multiply this a little bit tonight? Well, good question. So we landed in Vallejo. By landed, I don't mean flew in, but rode in. And we decided to go down to a park and just see if we could talk to anybody. And we met a kid whose parents just happened to leave that day on vacation. And we witnessed to him He invited us to come and stay with him. He fed us, and we had the best home to live in all week. And we went out and just ministered all week. I think we came back with 40, 50 bucks that people had given to us, and full stomachs, and God provided. Uh, it, It was a great lesson. But the greatest lesson I learned on that week was the lesson of the walnut. And I, you know, you can buy mixed nuts today, and you know, whatever. But every time I see a walnut, I thank the Lord for all the good food that my wife has made me all my life, you know. (laughs) And there was a contriteness that happened through that experience with me. Um, I absolutely believe penance and contriteness do accompany forgiveness. And when we lack 
penance or contriteness, I believe it's, it's because we've not truly experienced an understanding of the forgiveness of God. I always think penance is about doing things. It, do, I, I, do I have the wrong definition of penance? I like the, I like the movie uh, The Holy Grail where that scene says, and only the penitent will pass, you know, and he bows down and whoosh, that thing goes over his head, right? Only the penitent will pass. So it's, it's not so much doing penance, but it's a penitent heart. Heart, yeah. Yes, yes. Penance is often attributed to transactional things yes. between us and God. To be forgiven. Yes. Yeah. So... Obviously, sin can create a spiritual exile and a personal unhappiness in our lives and a bondage in a person that can happen. And forgiveness is just basically our fundamental salvation. That's what salvation is. It's forgiveness of our sins. And Jesus forgave sins, and he wanted people to know that their sins are forgiven if they simply ask and put their trust in him and put their trust in and their Father in heaven. Their, their sins are forgiven. So, it, you know, this time of year, it, it, you know, when the weather is 75 degrees, it's hard to get into the mood of Christmas. You know, in Minnesota it is. Uh, not so much so in California, but in, in Minnesota it's kind of hard to get in the mood. But as soon as that temperature hits, like, the mid-30s, and the frost is coming out on the ground, and Thanksgiving is just on the horizon, and it starts to feel like Christmas, right? And, and I, was, I was thinking about this whole aspect of Christmas, which is going to be on us before we know it. And Christmas is that time of the year where we celebrate the birth of our Savior, the birth of our Redeemer. And I thought to myself, what if people thought of Christmas as the season for easy forgiveness? What if they thought about Christmas as the season where forgiveness can be made easy for them? It's easy to see forgiveness as a gift yes. at Christmas time, It'd Jesus. Be, yes. Maybe, maybe a, we should wrap up a bunch of gifts and just put inside a little message that says, I forgive you, or Jesus has forgiven you. Um, not a, not a complicated forgiveness. Sometimes we can make even God's forgiveness very complicated, can't we? The, the, we, we? We require people to do all sorts of things to get themselves in a position to receive forgiveness. And that's not the forgiveness of our Lord. Uh, I wonder what, if, if, if Christmas became understood as the season for easy forgiveness, what that might do for the joy of Christmas. I wonder what that might do to raise people's spirits at the holiday season. What would happen if people saw forgiveness made easy as salvation and redemption? What would happen? Even though we make mistakes, even though we've failed, if we understood the heart of God, the compassionate father running to the prodigal, we all certainly could work on being a little bit more forgiving. But I think instead of trying to work harder at forgiving, if we just understood how much we were forgiven, that forgiveness would come more naturally to one another. And there's a big part of me that really believes that forgiving others would come much more easily if we would just walk daily and the forgiveness made easy for us. We would live in that place of gratitude to God. This forgiveness made easy that the Lord is offering to us every day. So I'd like to finish by just reading some scriptures together. They're relatively short. Uh, and I want us to take this and let it kind of be deposited in our hearts today. Let's start with Luke 3, verse 3. This is, this is talking about the apost uh, uh, the, John the Baptist and what he did. Then John went from place to place on both sides of the Jordan River, preaching that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. Yeah. So forgiveness was one of John the Baptist's main messages. 
that you can be forgiven. You don't have to be in shame. You don't have to live in guilt. You don't have to live in, in a constant place of remorse and regret. You can be forgiven. Yes. yes. Luke 24, 47. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. And what was the message? There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. Yeah, there's forgiveness for all, everybody, who simply is willing to say, forgive me, to I'm repent. Sorry. Yeah, there's forgiveness for all. Paul gets in on the deal here in the book of Colossians. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sin. Wow. And forgave our sin. He purchased our freedom and forgave our sin. Now we see the same thing in Ephesians 1, 7. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. When I think of this picture of being uh, purchased our freedom, I, I, my mind goes back to the movie Schindler's List where he kept paying people to give him Jews that he had a plan to try and save. And... Uh, it cost him something, but it didn't cost them anything to be purchased. There's a great cost to salvation, but the cost is not borne by us. It was borne by Jesus. And he not only purchased our freedom, but he forgave us of our sin at the same time. And if he's willing to purchase our freedom, he's willing to forgive us of our trespasses. I just love that picture. Let's look at Acts 13, 38. Brothers, listen. We are here to proclaim that through this man, Jesus, there is forgiveness for your sins. Through Jesus, there's forgiveness of sins. I, I, I can go on record, and I'm, I'm proud to go on record and not ashamed to go on record to say, Forgiveness of our sins comes in no other way than through the person of Jesus Christ. Recently heard of a person who uh, has really walked away from their Christian faith and are becoming even more and more religious than they were before. And it reminded me of what Paul was writing to the ch churches of Galatia from his experience at Antioch, where in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, he says, Who bewitched you that you would turn away from the gospel? Then he goes into almost this, I wouldn't call it a tirade, but, it, but this very exclamatory, passionate, declaration where it says even if an angel from heaven and of course a demon or anybody else came even if I came back to you and preached something different than what I preached with you before let that person be accursed because there is no salvation there is no forgiveness of our sins in any other way than through Jesus so if someone is dealing, if you have a friend that's dealing with shame, if you have someone who's dealing with remorse and guilt from some things that they have done in their past, the only solution for them is for you to lead them to Jesus. Ask them. You can say to them, I can help you. You don't have to spend $100,000 going to counseling to get rid of your guilt and your shame. In your torment, I can help you. Let me introduce you to my friend. His name is Jesus. And he gave his life to forgive all of us of our sins. And lead them in a prayer with Jesus. Let's go on. Luke chapter 1. This is a, uh, this is a statement by... Uh, 
uh, John the Baptist's father when he was about to be born and he got, he got the revelation that John was going to be born and this is his response to that. And you, my little son, will be called the prophet of the Most High because you will prepare the way for the Lord. You will tell his people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sins. Because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. I, I like this expression, um, you will tell his people how to find salvation. And salvation comes through the forgiveness of our sins. Nobody who's ever not been forgiven has ever felt salvation. Does that make sense to you? One of the accompanying aspects of being saved is the sense of being forgiven. This forgiveness of our sins. And then, of course, uh, I like this expression, because of God's tender mercy, just uh, this, this very big, tender being that speaks in the whole universe obeys him he's he's full of tender mercy and he just is described as the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us that of course was jesus to give light to those who sit in darkness there are multiple thousands millions of people today who are in darkness they just they're looking for a way i did a podcast recently with a person whose daughter was an unfortunate fentanyl victim. And she and her husband died, 27 years old. Did you know that over 100,000 people a year are dying from fentanyl, just fentanyl, in our country? In a decade, it's going to be over a million. And every single one of those people, most of them have parents, most of them have family. Most of them have friends. And they're, they're trying to find light into their life. They're trying to bring some light into their lives. And Jesus is the light that can free people from all of that. I don't have any judgment towards this gal or her husband or the father at all. All I have is a broken heart for them. And we have the answer. We have Jesus, who is the light of the world. And there are people who are sitting in darkness and in the shadow of death. And we can guide them to a path of peace. What a treasure we have. What an answer we have. That podcast will be released later this week. It'll be released this yeah. week, yeah. One more scripture from Acts chapter 10, verse 43. He is the one all the prophets testified about, saying that everyone who believes in him, Jesus, will have their sins forgiven through his name. You know, when you start looking at all of the scriptures in just the New Testament that actually refer to forgiveness, like well over 90% of them talk about the forgiveness we can have not the forgiveness we're to give to other people and I think that I think that was intentionally done by God for this reason that he's just emphasizing this message if we if we would just recognize how we are forgiven if we would just recognize that forgiveness has made been made easy for us if we would just understand this easy forgiveness, if we would just receive it and be, be totally forgiven in our hearts, we, it's like drinking love potion number nine. You go around kissing everything in sight. Well, we'll let you sing it at the benediction. <laughs> And if you read the New Testament, so much of the teaching on forgiveness is that the about forgiveness that you and I can have from God. And, you know, let's face it, most of us have done some 
pretty goofy things in our lives, you know, that we're not always very happy about. I don't want every event in my life to be played on this screen before you. You wouldn't want me to be your pastor anymore. <laughs> but I've been forgiven of those things. And because I'm forgiven, God is putting in my heart uh, a greater compassion for others who offend me. I, I would say that a good portion of my early Christian life, I had a works mentality. I had to do this. It was a, I had a, what I call a transactional relationship with God. If I did this, God would do that. It was very transactional. Uh, but as I've grown, grown older, I've realized just the simple, unconditional love God has for me. And that, yes, I have to believe in him to be forgiven, of course, but belief has never been thought of or talked about in the scriptures as a work, a work of righteousness. It's just believing in him. And as I believe in that forgiveness to me, there's been a transformation in my heart in the same way that, that little, those three little walnuts transformed my whole perspective. When I got back to our school that week, after that week, the first thing I did was I wrote my mom a letter and I asked her for, to forgive me. For not valuing all that she had put into my life for, for 23 years. How I had taken advantage of her, how I had expected things from her and not shown gratitude to her. One little walnut changed my life. And all it takes is one little encounter with Jesus to really sense his forgiveness. And it can transform how we interact with everyone else. So we can all have a Merry Christmas. Not because everything is good. Not because everything is perfect in our lives. But we can all have joy this Christmas because we've all been forgiven. We've all been forgiven.